Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of uh, Dose Nation. Unfortunately, James will not be joining me this week, so I'm doing a shorter, a uh, much shorter uh, version of the program to uh, just give everybody an update as to what's going on. All of the articles uh, from today's program can be found at www.drugpolicy.org forward slash blog forward slash weeks dash news dash drug policy dash September dash 27 dash 2013. So you can find all the articles for today. So it's this week's uh, news in drug policy, and that's what I wanted to discuss with it, with, it, with, it, with everyone today. I'm your host, Jay Kettle. Thanks for joining us. And the first story to come up is that the Guatemalan president went to the U.N. and uh, urged global drug policy reevaluation. And that's a very good thing because I think that many of these countries or many countries need to work together in order to create a sensible drug drug policy because the one that we have now is not sensible. Um, so I have to agree with the UN president. Guatemalan President Otto Perez Molina rose to power in 2011 on the promise of crushing organized crime. Um, now, just to, on a quick side note, organized crime, as we know in drugs, right, the sale and production of certain kinds of drugs are heavily intertwined. Uh, the former Army General pledged high security prisons and increased police force and deployment of soldiers in the fight against drug gangs, which have transformed Guatemala into one of the most violent places in the world, according to Al Jazeera America. But Perez Molina, in an apparent about face, turned heads last year when he became the first sitting head of state to propose the legal regulation of illicit drugs in front of the United Nations General Assembly. The war on drugs has failed Central America, he said at the time, adding that legalization should be considered as an alternative way to combat drug-related crime around the world. The Guatemalan leader on Thursday renewed calls for a new global dr uh, strategy on drugs, one that emerges from an inclusive global discussion. He called on the United Nations to reassess international policy at a special uh, sessions on drugs in 2016. Quote, since the start of my government, we have clearly affirmed that the war on drugs has not yielded the, the desired results. Perez uh, Molina told the General Assembly, we cannot keep, doing, keep, uh, keep on doing the same things and expecting different results. He believes that leaders must seek innovative approaches to drug use. Um, one centered on public health and addiction prevention. Priority must be given to reducing the social violence associated with drugs and respecting human rights which is something that is not taken into consideration with drug policy because what we do is we take nonviolent drug offenders, especially in the, in the United States, and there are drug gangs here that fight too, obviously, but uh, we take nonviolent users and we put them in jail. And by keeping this market illegal, by keeping, whether, whether it be the, mar the, the marijuana market illegal, the, uh, I, I don't know, whatever market you want to, you, you, you want to use as an example. By keeping it illegal, you're driving it further and further underground. And by doing that, you create um, a power vacuum. Everybody wants a piece of the pie. And that's what you have going on in a lot of South American countries, in the United States, and across the world. Is you have these factions battling each other for, for territorial control so they can continue to sell drugs and make money because it's a very lucrative market. It's totally illegal. You can't get it legally. They can set the price at, how, at however they'd like to set the price. And the problems continue to ensue. So I have to uh, give the Guatemalan president some, some serious credit for attempting to open up an international discussion on this in a serious way where human rights are actually taken into consideration. Because especially in the, in the, in the U.S. they're not. You know, a lot of people enter into a lot of drug users or people who are busted for a small possession enter into a prison uh, as a nonviolent individual and they come out sometimes as a very violent person or they come out with PTSD or they come out with something else because they of what they experienced in the prison uh you know somebody who smoked a joint should not be uh <laughs> in the same yard as a guy who murdered his, who murdered his entire family i mean there's just no comparison but and also, the other thing that we have to realize is that, especially in South America, one of the huge um, problems is that it drives a lot of peasants in, into poverty. Um, and you can, you, th this is not something that I've uh, researched or, or read about a lot particularly. I've just read some of uh, Professor Noam Chomsky's literature on it. So I'd recommend that everyone go out. And if you want to really 
uh, see how, how our, our drug policy in the United States impacts the third world, especially in South America, please go, go out and read uh, some of, some of uh, P- Professor Chomsky's work on it because it's unbelievable. Noam Chomsky is, uh, has, has a very good grasp on how this system affects people in South America and also how it affects us. So I would definitely suggest going back and taking a look at that. On to our next article, which uh, deals with a uh, a better topic: decriminalization. Uh, not not in the United States, but um, this is, came from uh, Bloomberg Big uh, Bloomberg Business Week in Kingston, Jamaica. Lawmakers on Tuesday debated a proposal to decriminalize the possession of small amounts of marijuana for personal use by adults in Jamaica, where many listener or, or where many islanders are expressing weariness with current drug policy. There is no bill uh, drafted or vote scheduled. However, the, uh, um, and various government administrations have talked about the issues for decades. But it's lately become a, a budding topic among Jamaicans, with some arguing that pot could become a major force for the struggling legitimate economy if it was no longer relegated to the underground. Well, we've seen that profits have been racked in the United States by, drug, by marijuana legalization. So, in the same vein... It would be very good for Jamaica. Uh, Jamaica is a considerably poorer country. Um, the other thing, uh, and this is a quote from the article, some lawmakers complain that current law results in about 300 young men receiving criminal records each week for possessing small amounts of ganja, uh, quote, creating a growing pool of unemployable people on the Caribbean island. So in, in a bad economy, you're creating people who can't get jobs because of their prison records for something that in really should be legal. So now they're considering the decriminalization. Um, there's, they're, of, of course, pushing the idea that it has harmful effects. Um, but uh, the an opposition lawmaker, his name is Daryl Vaz, a uh, former information minister, says, quote, there is no doubt that ganja can have harmful effects on an individual. So again, they're still pushing that end of it. But this does not warrant criminalization of thousands of Jamaicans for their personal choice and use, some for reasons deep-rooted in culture. So, um, you know, the first part of it aside, it, it, you know, people drink every day, they smoke every day. It shouldn't warrant criminalization. It doesn't warrant criminalization unless you're driving down the road in your car, you're drunk, you hit somebody. That requires criminalization. But if you're sitting home having a beer or if you're smoking a cigarette, both which are far more detrimental to your health than marijuana. But that's a, that's a whole other topic. Uh, if, if, you know, you can't ruin people's lives for that, why are you, why are you ruining people's lives for something that is uh, not as deleterious to the, to the individual's health and uh, actually may have some benefits for them, both psychologically and if they're sick physically. So... There is a lot to it, and and again, it would be very good for Jamaican, for the Jamaican economy, uh, because you're going to take away because more people are now going to be employable. You're going to have a booming uh, industry if if it becomes decriminalized and eventually legalized. You'll have an an industry that people can go into to work. It'll bring tourism to the country. It'll bring um, money into the government. So there are a lot of things that uh, that could benefit. Jamaica, and uh, or that could be, that will benefit both the Jamaican people and the Jamaican economy. So, I wanted to cover that because of the, I thought that was fascinating. It was very interesting. And uh, we'll we'll get back to the U.S. and marijuana um, in a little in in a, in a few minutes. But coming out of Reuters uh, today, prominent Mexicans urge government to decriminalize marijuana. A broad, uh, a broad spectrum of prominent Mexicans, including former ministers, businessmen, artists, and a, and a Nobel Prize winning scientist on Wednesday, urged the government to decriminalize marijuana in a bid to curb gang violence and corruption. Since 2007, about 80,000 people have been killed in turf wars between drug cartels and their clashes with security forces, leading to calls for a change in policy in Mexico and elsewhere in the U.S.-led war on drugs. Wednesday's newspaper advertisement urging the decriminalization of cannabis brought together one of the most diverse of coalitions pushing for change in Mexico. Those lobbying included a number of influential figures in public life. 
Among the signatories were several former ministers from the ruling Institutional Revolution, um, Revolutionary Party, famous actors, media tycoon Richard Salinas uh, Pelig Peligo, one of Mexico's richest men, and the 1995 Nobel laureate for chemistry, Maria Molina, or, or excuse me, Mario Molina. So there are a lot of prominent citizens in Mexico right now that are um, urging for the decriminalization. Uh, they're arguing that, that criminalization has made um, narcotics more lucrative for cartels, which is true. Um, and that, uh, quote, Mexico has, a, has paid a high price for applying the punitive policy of prohibition. 80,000 people is a lot, especially over something like marijuana and other drugs and substances. The, the more we fight these people, that we think that we're winning, the more we empower them because it gives them a reason to keep going. Uh, it makes, by, by keeping these drugs illegal, it makes the market much more lucrative because there's only one market, it's the black market, and that's it. So, uh, and of course the states that border Mexico don't have legalization with the exception of California, but I, d I don't know enough to, 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 to speak on California's relationship with, with Mexican drug cartels, so I won't. But another South American, or another um, Latino country that is urging for drug decriminalization or marijuana de decriminalization because they've seen the effects of it. They see how, how deleterious it is to the heart and, and soul, so to speak, of their countries, and they're looking to take action about it. And they have every reason and every right in the world to want to do that. And, uh, of course, with the support of the people, there should be no reason why it shouldn't be done. So for our last article for today, I'm going to, uh, to talk about uh, the average... Uh, <laughs> from the Seattle Times, coming from the West Coast. And uh, if James was here, I'm sure he would get a kick out of this. But average pot users uh, uh, the, an average average pot user consumes 123 joints per year the state estimates uh, state officials expect the average pot user to smoke 123 joints a year but joints may be obsolete soon so the state projects that consumers will use an equal amount of pot of, of pot laced edibles and concentrates like hash oil that's already been on the been on the rise, and this, and that's something that that uh, was discussed in a previous Dose Nation podcast. There's a huge uh, push, uh, or there's a huge surge, of people using concentrates over over flowers. And one of the things uh, w one of the things that I've said about this in the past is that it it brings down people's tolerances for the plant itself. So, um, you know unless you're going to dab all the time or unless you're going to use high concentrates all the time, uh, when you go back to smoking the flower, it can it has less of an effect. You're not feeling it as much. It might not be giving you the relief you want. So um, that's part of the, the issue is that once you start smoking these, these concentrates, high concentrates for a long amount of time, your body begins to build up that tolerance to it. And then eventually, when you want to go back or if you want to go back to smoking the flower, it doesn't have the same kick to it, so to speak. So that's the only thing that I would that I would warn people. Now, on the positive side, with things with concentrates, edibles, and so on, is that medically, uh, for people with anxiety, for people with depression, for people um, with with physical with other physical conditions, these things are great options uh, because they help a lot. And for some people, they really work. But again, my only concern is that for the average the average user or the average patient, if it's not uh, or, not, or not patient, sorry, just the average user. Um, because I can't speak on, uh, you know, on behalf of of, of, of a patient. So, um, but for the average user, yeah, you know, the dabs are nice, but you know, once you begin to to, to do it all the time, it becomes the only thing that you really want to do, and it becomes hard to smoke flowers. And I and I and I have seen seen that happen to people, and there are stories of that. Not not that it's some horrific thing. Oh no, you know, that he's smoking a concentrate instead of. The, <laughs> instead of the flower anymore. I mean, it's not like there's a there's a there's a problem or there's some kind of you know moralistic uh, charge behind it, but it's just on a, on a on a purely objective level, there is a tolerance difference. So, you know what? I'm going to do one more article because uh, this one I thought was interesting. Why party pills? 
Are Legal in New Zealand. This is a column uh, by Ross Bell from USA Today. While the United States is dipping a toe into drug legalization with medical marijuana and in a few states, recreational marijuana, our efforts in New Zealand to deal with drugs outside the criminal system are going in another direction. Given our remote ge geographic location, smuggling is risky, rare, and expensive. Most of the drugs New Zealanders use are produced locally. Lately, new synthetic drugs that mimic the effects of harder-to-acquire drugs are gaining traction. According to the Drug Policy Alliance, synthetic drugs are becoming increasingly prevalent in the U.S. as well. A recent University of Michigan study, uh, or excuse me, survey found that the use of synthetic drugs among high school students is now second only to marijuana. A string of recent deaths from synthetic club drugs, uh, club drug overdoses in the U.S. has caught the attention of both federal lawmakers and the Drug Enforcement Administration. Um, New Zealand has yet to face those kinds of deaths, but they are already seeing the harm caused by new psych psychoactive substances, more commonly known here as legal highs or party pills. The untested and, un and unregulated substances are difficult to monitor, and often no one, not even the amateur manufacturer, knows what's really in them. Now, again, and we've had this conversation before. We've spoken with uh, Dr. Dave Nichols about this. Um, we've spoken to other people about this. And, again, these things can be very dangerous unless you're a very experienced user, and even then they can be incredibly dangerous. Um, my biggest problem with them is that there really is no long-term human um, studies that, that have been done, like with LSD or psilocybin or ayahuasca, where you have a 5,000-year history of usage. So they're new. They've been made recently. Nobody's sure how they're going to impact people in the future. And some people have a great time with it. Other people have horrible times with it. So it also depends on the individual. So I'm kind of mired in the middle as far as the experience goes. But as far as taking them regularly or taking them at all, stay. I, I, I would say stay away from them unless you're unless you really know what you're doing. But... You know, even then, uh, I, I don't advocate the use of, of, of any of these substances. Uh, this is just for educational purposes only because, uh, again, there, there, there's been strings of deaths, of deaths in the United States, and uh, it's becoming a problem in New Zealand now. So just be very, very careful um, and make sure that you know what you're doing because if not, you can end up in a hospital bed or worse. So... Uh, that's that. That's the only comment that I could make there because, uh, I mean, I would just be rehashing old old arguments if I really said anything else. So, but that's all for today, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Jay Kettle, here at Dose Nation. James is uh, taking some time off, uh, so uh, there's not going to be the regular podcast out this week. But I wanted to put something out for you guys to listen to and hear. If there's anything that you want uh, me to talk about, uh, or that you want to hear from me, or any kind of uh, uh, policy analysis or any other topics that you'd like to hear about, free, uh, feel free to email, uh, email us at contact at dosenation.com and uh, send us your, your suggestions. Post it in the comments. Uh, post it on the Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash dosenation. Send it to us on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash dosenation. And make sure that you uh, follow the YouTube page because I'll start posting stuff there as well, which I, and I already have. There's one video up there now called The Abbey. Uh, Jake's experience at a Benedictine monastery, so you can go check that out. And uh, that's youtube.com forward slash Dose Nation TV uh, or Dose Nation video. It's one of the two. So, anyway, thanks for listening, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you'd like to hear more things like this, uh, more weekly news reports with some commentary, um, let me know. Uh, my guy would be more than willing to, con to continue to do it. So, well, thanks for joining us, everybody. I'll see you uh, hopefully next week, if not sooner right here at Dose Nation. Thanks for listening.